Let's see. Next we have Rick Wagner from the San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, Rick Wagner is the HPC Systems Manager at San Diego Supercomputing Center, where he's responsible for the operation of one-third of Exceed's high-performance computing resources, Trestles, Gordon, and Comet. This role, combined with his work as a part-time scientist, make his feelings swing between those of absolute power and sheer terror at the thought of destroying someone's work through incompetence. This I can relate to. Um, San Diego uh, Supercomputing, uh, you know, our partners in the Terror Grid. Uh, I have many fond memories <laughs> of spending time at SDSC, uh, you know, haggling with the rest of our partners about, you know, all kinds of things. Rick Wagner, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Stephen Stems. Um, I always have to say it's, it's a bit odd to come into a meeting and have the second smoothest voice in the room. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Stephen, a leader in many ways. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our very recent experience in deploying uh, Comet and its supporting file system. Uh, this is going to be very much a brain dump of the various things that we had to deal with, focusing primarily on the networking and the performance aspects that we're getting out of ZFS. So. The motivator for the new file system is Comet. We do have a computer. It is running. Friendly users are on it now. We got the hardware in January. Uh, it has been incredibly fast-paced deployment and uh, a little bit exhausting. So some aspects of it. The, this system was part of a response to an NSS solicitation um, about what did we think of as the long tail of science. So a lot of the needs that Malcolm just discussed um, for generic use this was the NSF solicitation to build a supercomputer for those types of users, um, particularly, uh, you know, think of biology, sociology, the people who are now on-roading to HPC and computational science. And we, uh, so we addressed that with the design of Comet. And the first thing we looked at was the reality check, okay? You know, we talk about supercomputing, we talk about HPC, what size jobs? How many people are really doing large-scale parallel computing? And we looked at XDMOD, uh, the, or the database that supports, uh, attracts all the data and jobs, and um, the first thing that we found was that if you look at the total number of jobs that are running at certain scales, this is a cumulative distribution, 99% of the jobs are running on uh, smaller than 2048 cores, so about a rack. Um, in our case, it ends up being uh, a little bit more than a rack. And, that, and not just the jobs, because we know that small jobs don't uh, consume a lot of time, but it turns out that in aggregate, they are 50% of the use. So when you think about building a system like this, you may not be thinking you need another Kraken. Um, what you might be thinking is you need a bunch of Linux clusters. And so, we thought about building a system that would serve communities via gateways, um, via reliable storage that's high performance and has more aspects of what you would see within a single uh, small campus cluster but scaled out. We really want to reach the, the, the small users. Um, there's some other technologies uh, I'd love to talk to you about uh, if you want to ask me about them. In particular, the virtualized HPC clusters. Um, we've had very good success with single root iOS virtualization for performance via Mellanox um, and our deliverable for this year is to give users full root access to their own virtualized cluster at near native hardware performance. Um, no, they will not be mounting my Lester file system on it because we're not that dumb. But uh, I would love to talk with Stephen later about security models that could help with this. Um, but that is you know, not a topic of this slide, but I'd love to uh, talk to you guys about it. Okay. So in aggregate, if you add up all the numbers, it should be about two petaflops. Uh, we, Dell, sold us the hardware for the compute side. Um, you can probably guess who sold us the other stuff. It was Aon. Um, 2,000 nodes. And each one's dual socket Haswells. And with, you know, we threw SSDs in the nodes to support the virtual machines and the fact that the jobs that can take advantage of local scratch space. We spend a lot of time working with users saying, use Lustre, don't use Lustre, use Lustre, don't use Lustre, um, like everyone else does. Um, and so we have SSDs on the nodes for temporary files and whatnot. We have some GPU nodes. I think that every general use cluster needs some accelerators, um, maybe not all accelerators. And we have some large memory nodes coming because there are a need for some large memory applications and you need a complement. Now, 
When it comes to the stuff that we're going to deal with, uh, hybrid fat tree topology. Basically, we have a full fat tree within the rack and a four to one oversubscription between the racks. That's how we decided to allow jobs up to 1,700 cores um, can run within a rack like they're running on a giant, um, like a full scale supercomputer. But we also cap the job sizes to be limited to within a rack. We have 27 racks, and we don't expect that many large jobs. We went out and bought our new storage, 7.6 petabytes from Aon. We're going to go into that a lot. The stuff I talked about in 2013, our first file system, we are reusing it. We um, have taken out a warranty, and we are going to run that for four more years as a replica. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. The same hardware that we're using for Lustre, um, we purchased variants of that for the home file servers. We're using that for our campus cluster. We try to pick a solution and stick with it. Oh yeah, and we have 100 gigabits connectivity because bandwidth is cool. All right, so <laughs> here is the kind of uh, eye chart um, breakdown where maybe I should have brought a laser pointer. Um, but the way that we get to our storage is through Ethernet, and I'll be covering this in a few more slides. Uh, the, we have Arista switches that have been upgraded. These are 7508s, E's. Um, they handle the 100 gigabit connectivity. They also handle the 40 gigabit connectivity and the 10 gigabit connectivity. So first generation servers, 10 gig. We're now at dual 40 gigs um, in our servers. And then we go through Mellanox uh, Ethernet IB gateways to get to the fabric. So we use TCP driver for Lustre. Um, and then we have data mover nodes. We, uh, we actually, one of the reasons we use Ethernet is to cross mount everything everywhere. So we're keeping the same data, data mover nodes in production for now. The namespace will not change. Um, we don't jerk the users around and say new data mover nodes, new this, new that. File system mount points don't change. So this is what it'll look like roughly um, conceptually for the users. We're going to split the new performance storage in half into two file systems. Um, the one that's Scratch is named Panda, and the one that is going to be the project space, which is allocated through Exceed um, with quotas, et cetera, is called Wombat, and there'll just be an even split. We had a long discussion about how many servers to put in each one, blah, 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 and we just finally got sal Salomnic on it. We're going to use, we were using Robinhood um, to do the replica. And when I talk about the replica um, from our first generation, it'll be about six petabytes of the original servers. It has a plethora of MDTs because it originally supported four file systems. Um, but the way to think about this, what we're calling durable storage, this is not a user accessible file system. It is going to be old hardware. There will be lots of disks that are going to be replaced. Our goal is to have a slightly stale disaster recovery system. That is really the intention. This is something very, I don't know how many other centers can provide this, um, but we didn't want to waste the storage that we already had. This is just kind of a feature add um, because we can reuse it. Our goal is to basically have about a, a week, um, be no older than a week uh, in terms of the, the age of the data. And we'll exclude you know, quick changes. So we'll lock out files that are only a day or two old or recently created so that we're not dealing with files that are thrashing all the time. But files that have existed a little bit longer. So we'll let you know about this uh, next year. OK. The big challenge with this that is the juggling act is the fact that all of that storage is still currently in use. And we have to build it up over time. And so somebody, I, I heard the conversation about rsync again um, and the distributed copy tools and stuff like that. We have developed our own tool. It's AMQP based. It's a worker service. You can scale it up. You can scale it down. It's not currently intended for user space, but very happy to share it and describe it with people. Um, in fact, I may have my developer up here next year talking about it um, because it has really saved us because it can use as recursion to go into directories and move things around, and you can actually control the number of threads, and it's not locking it in like something like MPI does where you have a fixed number of tasks. So we can throttle the uh, replication tool based on the load of the servers. So if you start driving when your MDT is underwater or MDS is underwater because of this, you can actually slow it down. This isn't intended for the Robinhood type stuff. This is because we're moving from systems that were 1.8, and then we're Lustre 2, and so forth, and so on. And, and so we're just doing a file copy method. So more to talk about. All right, let's get to the cool stuff. So one of the things we had to do to satisfy the National Science Foundation and get paid so that other people could get paid um, was to hit 6.25 gigabytes per server with read or write um, across the system. 
And to do that, we focused on the ZFS array level performance. We focused on Lustre's performance, and of course LNet because we've got these, uh, all this funky networking. Here's a summary of some of the things we did. First of all, we moved to the Linux 3.10 kernel on the server side. We are running patchless. Um, we added the large block support. Thank you, Brian Bellendorf, um, and the others who have worked on that. We did some tuning for prefetch to help get the data into memory and take advantage of the arc. Um, and lots and lots of patches to Lustre, most of, most of which fortunately have landed. So um, my last slide covers all the software releases and it's already out of date because 2.7 came out and 6.4 came out for ZFS. Um, big deal with SMP Affinity. Uh, I'll cover that in a little bit, but it really did matter where you were putting tasks and where you were locking them onto um, CPU partitions and things like that. And in the end, we ended up rearranging the network cards and the HBAs in the system to get them talking directly to the socket. So we knew we were doing ZFS from the very beginning, and we designed the servers with Aon um, for that. So this is kind of just a reference. It's 60 drives per server, four terabyte drives, 4K native using um, emulation, and there's 10 in the chassis and 50 in the JBODs. Their each drive is rated to 225 megabytes per second um, from Seagate, and we'll see how close we get to that. Uh, Another thing that changed from our existing systems, we now have multipathing. Um, for to start with, we're doing uh, failover manually. We will move to HA um, for everything, but software updates just got a hell of a lot easier. Not having to take down the server to fix things. All right, so this is the breakdown. When you have the OSTs and you have HBAs, you have to decide what's the primary path, and we are explicitly routing the paths. We are selecting the multipath targets to pick the drives. There's an internal HBA that talks to the first 10 drives in the chassis. There is then two external facing ones that talk to both JBODs. We assign the primary server um, to one JBOD and the other server has the other JBOD. And as far as the paths go, each um, HBA has a direct path to two OSTs and then the last OST um, straddles the two HBAs. You could carve this up in different ways. Performance was not as sensitive to this as long as it was balanced. So it's not like OST5 is slow. Um, it's actually just fine. So, all right. Um, read performance. So we always start at the low level, right, when you're doing a, a new file system. Um, and I'm starting with this one, which might give you a hint about what I'm going to talk about with write performance. So read performance on the arrays using native ZFS, figuring that that's the best we could get. Start out with an eight drive stripe test. This is largely just to make sure that the plumbing is correct. So I've got eight drives and I look at all the OSTs and I'm doing this simultaneously rock solid, one and a half gigabytes per second using stripes. This is 50% faster than what I got with, um, j without large block support. So I would get one gigabyte a second per OST without large block. I got one and a half width. So on these things, if this was a local server that was doing disk activity, it would kick ass, right? It would be nine gigabytes a second um, reading. So go to RAID Z1, still just about nine. Go to RAID Z2, it's still nine. So I can say that large block support read performance um, on these servers is phenomenal. All right, therefore, let's talk about writes, because I had to get the data on there somehow. Um, I am not using um, compression. Uh, I'm just using, I'm writing a random file, um, letting it do its job. Okay, so stripe case, eight gigabytes a second. Okay, that's not, that doesn't shock me too much. Um, RAID Z1, 6.5 gigabytes a second. RAID Z2, 4.2. So we have an issue with write performance with RAID Z2, um, and this is insensitive to the change of large block support. Now, when you go through the mental map of what might be causing this, you start to think about the things that uh, ZFS is doing under the hood all the time and what is changing. Um, obviously, the RAID algorithms are changing with this, um, but it's always doing the transaction group sync and it's always doing the checksums. So I've seen a lot of traffic about whether or not it's TXG sync or something or um, other stuff, but I think I can point to where this issue is coming from. Oh, and by the way, we are running RAID Z2. We didn't do anything foolish like go to striping. I did joke about that for a while. Okay. So you fire up a tool like perf, 
and you look at your counters. Perf gives you the fraction of time that the kernel is spending or the tasks are spending in different places. So this is during um, the writes to a striped file system. And on the right, you see all the ZFS type tasks. And on the left, you see basically um, the make random file writing to disk. This is with RAID Z2. By the way, um, when you look at my slides, you'll be able to click on these. These are scalable vector graphics that are really nice. You can zoom in and stuff like that. Um, and so what you notice when you go between these is on the right, all these ZIO writes and intents and stuff like that suddenly jump up and get an extra piece, a little block on there. And so you do your clicking and you zoom in and you go, okay, the write intents got a little bit um, longer and the write issues, and there's 12 of them. And then THG sync is taking up like no time. So I don't think that's the issue. You zoom in and you look at a single one of these tasks and you look and you go, hmm, when I'm doing striped writes, checksums take about 3% of the time um, in total or, or for the task. And then the write issues take very little. But when you go to RAID Z2, the parity calculation jumps in and eats up everything. So I don't know why on our system the RAID Z2 parity calculation is such a bigger hit. I've heard other people anecdotally report that um, they do not see this large of a swing. So it's a very good chance I'm doing something wrong. There's a very good chance there's a ZFS expert in the room that'll tell me it, and I will stand there like Stallone and say that I don't know how to use the three seashells. Um, so for those of you who still get that reference. <laughs> so if you, um, if you do a, some quick math and you do an estimate comparing the time spent in parity, uh, you can say, well, if I had 100 seconds spent doing reads and I add on the extra time, what would my performance be? Um, it would be about four and a half gigabytes a second. So the math matches roughly the performance numbers that I actually observe. Fortunately, um, help is on the way. We do have AVX in our systems. Um, we have Ivy Bridges. No reason not to use it. Uh, Brian pointed me at the work that's going on already to get AVX into the checksumming. I don't see any reason why this couldn't be um, looked at for the parity calculation as well. So it's math. It's array math. We should, we should go for it. Um, I may actually help out with that one just to feel like a developer again. Bridges, i um, going to go very quickly over this. The biggest thing about the bridges, for those of you who go to deploy them, is they have an issue with having only a single lid um, on them. And when the IB clients are sending data out of the fabric from the left on the compute nodes out to the Ethernet side, it has to have a destination. The way Mellanox implemented this was to put a virtual target channel adapter onto the SX36, the box in purple, and uh, the, when it's sending to the Ethernet side, the ARP request is handled on the IB side by the gateway by giving that lid as the destination for the entire Ethernet fabric. So what that means is every single client is trying to go to its switch and using a single exit port and a single exit port constantly. So even if you have 18 cables going in, um, a single uh, group of nodes attached to a single switch can only take advantage of one. Return traffic is good. Um, return traffic is balanced. So we mitigate this by what I use MinHops plus RIC. Um, RIC writes code that goes in and actually manually routes each one of these switches um, to send the gateway paths. So I balance and make sure that they're all, um, all four gateways are balanced across each top switch, or top rack switch, and then it's balanced across the entire mid tier. So on the whole, the cluster can easily saturate the gateways, but with, in a small group of nodes within the racks, things aren't as pretty. We also have to break up this giant slash 19 that I managed to talk our network engineers out of. So we have four slash 21s. Each gateway handles a single VLAN, and that way I throw nine servers, one MDT, um, eight OSS is behind uh, in each VLAN, and so they handle the ARP requests appropriately, and the data flows through the bridges. So this was one of the bigger challenges. Um, got four uh, aliases on each node. Um, <laughs> remember, LNET is not TCP and IP. Um, there's only a single LNET NID. I, I screwed that up and that killed m two hours of my day. Um, I tried to put four NIDs on because I thought I had to. Uh, quick comment, um, NUMA. Very, very big deal, especially when you're dealing with bonded drivers. The tasks can't tell with a bonded driver which socket um, the traffic's coming in on. So we solved that 
uh, by attaching both the NICs to a single socket. Um, and a lot of this is for reference, so I've got all my configurations that folks can look at them later. Um, I do leave some cores free um, in my CPU partition for IRQ handling. I did not find the Mellanox tuning stuff to be particularly helpful. Um, it wasn't necessary. Tuning would actually drive down performance. Don't know why. This is a LNET read test. It's showing 10 gigabytes a second coming out of one of the servers. I have two 40 gig cards, so this is awesome. <laughs> um, I could almost get the same amount, of, I get about 80 uh, or eight gigabytes a second going in. These servers don't consume data as well as they put it out. But read performance um, through, the, through LNET, fantastic. So I was very happy to see saturating these 40 gig cards. We knew that would be a challenge. So here is something that is it should, be, should have been a little bit better, but this is 16 of our servers um, showing 7.2 gigabytes a second reads through Lustre, through all our funky network and stuff like that, um, and showing the aggregate performance required. Uh, there's some fine print. I was first looked at this number. I looked at the total bandwidth envelope, um, and I saw uh, 108. I scratched my head because I'd seen 115 before. And then I went back and checked the individual server performance that I was measuring and realized that I had dropped a server. Um, either I screwed up my file striping or I uh, didn't turn on the measurement tool um, during the run. So should be 115 and it's 7.2 gigabytes a server. And I think that's bang for the buck. We're still doing pretty good. All right, ZFS and Lustre met metadata. Last serious part of the topic. Um, we are using ZFS for the metadata. Our goal is data integrity. That's why we have the replicas, stuff like that. Um, and I just really like ZFS for array management a lot more um, than, I've ever, than I did with MD RAID. Um, I like global spares, stuff like that. So two MDSs, multi-pathed, um, MDT0 and using DNE for MDT1. So each one is a primary. So we have failover and performance. Uh, really like this setup. And something that I did go back and check on, because um, there's a presentation, I think, last year by Gabriel um, about, uh, about metadata performance. Uh, he talked about ZFS and Lustre. I'm not, I don't think I found anything new about that, but I did do a check to compare. So I did a native ZFS test for metadata performance, and I did a Lustre one. So when we do an MD test with Lustre, um, 48 nodes, about 1,000 tasks, um, 1.8 million files per directory. The, it, this is a log scale. So yeah, stats and reads are relatively quick. Um, and this is comparable to what was presented in that other slide deck. Now, when you go and you run the same test locally on the system, these numbers get a lot different. Um, everything moves up immensely. Uh, again, it's a log scale, and you start seeing extra digits appear um, in these. So this is on the server, obviously fewer tasks because I've only got 24 cores, so I ran 16 tasks and uh, about 250,000. I redid this one a couple of times with more files, got comparable numbers. So let's look at what ZFS can do through its own file system and compare it to Lustre. And with the log scale, some things get hidden, like um, File creation goes up by a factor of almost four. So I don't know much about how Lustre is interacting with ZFS on the MDTs and stuff like that. But um, I would like to think that improvements could be made to take advantage of the small block operations that have to be going on here. And I'm not running a ZIL with this. Um, this was just using the same drives, the same arrays, um, this actually the same VDEV. I think I just reformatted it when I was done. So I think there's um, work to be done here to bring uh, Lustre metadata performance um, on par with ZFS's. So it certainly handle the small block operations. Lustre stack. Uh, we're now using EL repo uh, 310 kernel. We were at the latest bleeding edge of everything. So this slide is now outdated. We're now using the latest 2.7 release. Um, the, uh, and SPL 0.6.4 and ZFS 0.6.4. We are applying the large block patch because that didn't land yet. And most of these other patches uh, have landed. The ones that I had to apply manually uh, because they conflicted were the large black compat and I think the spill alloc 16038. The one that really made a gigantic difference was the bug fix to correct the DMU read um, where it was doing screwy stuff. Um, 
Many, many thanks to Intel um, and the engineers for helping me through this. We do have an Intel support contract for level three. I think we went to level four. Uh, so we got into the guts and it was exciting uh, to get it done. Doug and Jeff, as always, it is awesome working with you guys. So Aon Computing. Mellanox, uh, another one of our vendors, also a big help even when they finally realized what was going on with the lid. Um, they got on the phone with me, they talked me through it, they helped me come to the solution with the manual routing. Um, IU is a partner on Comet, by the way, for virtualization, working with uh, Mr. Fox, Professor Fox. Uh, and of course, UC San Diego is where my checks come from, um, and Dell gave us a bunch of computers because the NSF is giving us money. So, thank you very much.